Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Water Wise Plant Selection webinar. Today, this webinar is sponsored by the City of Livermore, Cal Water, and Zone 7 Water Agency. Let's see if I can get this slide to move. There we go. All right, so before we get started, we're just going to have some quick introductions so you can get to know the people who are on this call. So first off, we'll have um, our representatives from Zone 7 Water Agency introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alexander Bradley. I'm the communications specialist for Zone 7 Water Agency, and I manage all of our communications outreach program and schools program and uh, keep our website up to date and our social media uh, current. So if you ever need any information, you can always visit our website or our Facebook pages, YouTube and Nextdoor. Hi, I'm Allison Cleary. I'm our current conservation coordinator. I'm running our rebate programs. So if you apply for our washer rebate, our irrigation controller rebate or our lawn conversion rebate, you will be communicating with me um, we've also just um, put out some information through our garden by number program. So we have some um, recommended plant pairings of a list of plants and designs to help people with converting their, um, their lawns to low water gardens. All right, and my name is Natalie Croak. I work for the city of Livermore as its water resources communications representative. That means I'm responsible for putting out information related to your sewer and stormwater system. Also, if you receive your water service from Livermore Municipal Water, I am also your communications representative and I help out with some of the water conservation programs that are available to you. Great. Ms. Paro, let's, I, we didn't hear from you before we go to Cal Water. <laughs> I'm Para Flores, I'm at Zone 7 Water Agency, and I manage our integrated planning section at Zone 7, which includes conservation. All right. We got a lot of... Uh got a lot of conservation activity going on here. My name is Susan Cordone and I am also a conservation coordinator for California Water Service, also known as Cal Water. Um, I am responsible for assisting our customers, large and small, with their efforts in water conservation, whether you're a small business or a large, um, or a large business or a small property owner, whatever it is, uh, we're really uh, interested in helping you out in water savings efforts. So thank you and I'm glad you've joined today. Super. Hi, I'm Jackie Williams Cartwright of Alden Lane Nursery. Uh, we're celebrating 66 years um, in business, which is wonderful. Started by my folks. Uh, we've grown with Livermore. Livermore's grown with us, and we're so happy to be a part of this program. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. So now that you've got to hear a little bit about the people who are going to be presenting today, let's talk about how you will be able to participate. So since this is a Zoom webinar, we cannot see or hear you, but you will be able to participate and ask Jackie lots of questions. So there are two ways that you will be able to do this. You can use the Q&A or the chat feature. So both of these buttons should be at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question specifically for Jackie, go ahead and use the Q&A feature. You'll be able to type in your question, hit send, and then we might type a question back to you if it's a really easy one. But if it's something that we think Jackie may have to go into more detail on, we might wait until the very end when we have our Q&A session to read it out loud for her. Now, the chat feature works really well if you have a question that you would like other people on this webinar to weigh in on. We're expecting about 300 people today in this webinar, so there are lots of people to ask questions like, I don't know, maybe you're interested in hiring a new landscaper and you want to know if there's anybody out there who really likes the one that they have now. That would be a perfect question to put into the chat and allow people to weigh in on. So just to sum it up, if you have a question for Jackie, put it in the Q&A. If you have a question for the whole group, please use the chat feature. And finally, this webinar will be recorded, so don't feel like you need to write down everything Jackie's saying really quickly. We will email out a link to this recording after the webinar is over. All right. So we're just going to give a brief overview on the rebates that are available here in the Tri-Valley. 
So I know that some people on this call are not uh, Livermore residents. So if you um, receive your water service from Dublin San Ramon Services District or City of Pleasanton, pretend like you get your water service from the City of Livermore. <laughs> the the uh, stipulations will be exactly the same. But basically, um, if you receive your water service from Livermore, Pleasanton, Dublin, San Ramon, you're going to apply for a lawn conversion rebate through Zone 7 Water Agency. And if you receive your water service from Cal Water, they have their own separate program for you guys. All right, and then I'll have Allison from Zone 7 go a little bit into what you need to do to make sure the plants that you choose for your program qualify for the rebates. Yeah, so um, one of the main things about the rebate program is that we are only accepting uh, low or very low for use plants. So one of the ways to do that is to go to our Tri-Valley Waterwise Gardening site. And so all those plants are, um, they've been researched and determined to be really well suited to our area. So all the plants on there qualify for the rebate. But this Wu calls list on the right, the water use classification of landscape species, that's a little bit more complicated, so I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of how that works. Um, that organizes plants by um, different regions and different water use. So that's the list where we're only accepting low and very low water use. And their website has been down and having issues for the last um, week or so, so I am going to be using a different interface. But it does work um, almost exactly the same. So I'm going to do a walkthrough on a different website. but. Um, it will be doing pretty much the same thing as you would be doing on that website. All right, and then before she does her walkthrough, we'll just have Kyle Water talk a little bit about the plants that qualify for their rebate program. We're definitely mirroring the same concept whereby we would like for only plants that are very low or low water use um, to be planted um, post a turf removal. And it's very important with Cal Waters turf removal program that you go to our website in advance of putting a shovel into the ground because um, we will not accept applications that have already started or projects that have already started. But again, the low water use, low to low, very low, excuse me, very low to low water use plants are um, eligible for the program in our lawn to garden program. And more information is available on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. No problem. All right. So Allison is going to give a quick walkthrough on how you can use these plant databases to figure out if a plant that you want to put in will qualify for the rebate. Alrighty, so again, it's gonna look a little different, but it should work almost exactly the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Okay, so. Um, this is just a different a different website that displays the same wood calls list. So we are this north central coast region. Um, you can also go ahead and come down here and search by city. Um, so this will put us in the right area. Then what you can go ahead and do here is if you're looking for a certain type of plant, you can go ahead and select that box for ground cover, trees, um, whatever it is you're looking for. But um, at the very least, you should start with uh, checking the boxes for low or very low water use. And then um, you can go down here and show plants for this region. And this list will show you, um, oh, I don't know why it's showing moderate. Sorry, find here. <laughs> we'll just ask everyone to ignore the moderate, low to very low. How yeah, is sorry. that? Yeah, no, I clicked, no, I clicked the all plants. Because oh, okay. Doing, but it's the find here that'll, that'll use that search function. So it's all good. Display all the low and very low um, water use plants. And I actually really like this website because um, you can look at a plant and you might not know what that plant looks like from, you know, the Latin name or even the common name. But what you can do is you can go to this link and it'll pull up a photo of it, which is kind of nice. Um, so that can help a little bit with your planning is you can go ahead and look at some photos of it and get an idea of what some of these plants look like because um, there are a ton of plants on this list and 
definitely um, a lot of different versions of names for plants. You'll definitely see very different versions of the common names. Um, so there are a ton of options on here, but you definitely do need to plan in advance. You need to give us a list before you start your project. Um, and we are a little bit flexible. If you're not sure if you're gonna be able to find things at a nursery, definitely do your research. Maybe go check out the nursery first, talk to them, talk to us, say, hey, um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to find these. Um, here's a few backup options. I wanna make sure they're low or very low water. Um, just so that way, if I can't find these first five, at least I have backup options that I know are approved. And so we can give you a little bit of flexibility there, as long as we know that everything meets the requirements. But these, um, these low and very low water lists are really good. Um, but that's pretty much it for how these WooCalls lists works. They're pretty nice. And again, if you're looking for anything specific in terms of ground cover, things like that, you can add those to the search or native plants, you can add that to the search too. But again, we are this North Central Coast region, WooCalls region one. Um, and then again, our Tri-Valley WaterWise website has all plants that are well suited to our region. So anything on that website will qualify for our rebate also. And that has a bunch of great photos and things like that on there. And this website's kind of nice too, because if you find a plant you like, you can go ahead and put a check mark here and select a few. And then you can go ahead and go here and export it to a list. And then if you have an account, um, it does give you the option to export it directly to a list. And then you have a nice setup list that you can send directly to us with all your plants. And the water use is all on there. And we have all the information we need to go ahead and start coordinating your rebate with you. Great. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to share my screen again. There we go. All right. So Allison was saying, you know, the WooCalls database is pretty powerful. You go into that system and even if you filter by low and very low water use plants, you'll still end up with hundreds and hundreds of options. And for a lot of people who apply for this rebate, it can be a little overwhelming, especially because you don't know what is easily you know, what you can easily find in your local nurseries. So we're very excited to have Jackie Williams Courtright from Alden Lane um, kind of walk us through some of the plants that she knows work really well in the Tri-Valley, are low water use, do qualify for all of the rebates we just talked about, and that you can actually find in a nursery around us. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do right now is part of Jackie's presentation is pre-recorded. You'll see why very quickly. She's going to be talking about a lot of plants that she had to put together. Um, but after the pre-recording, we're going to go to Jackie live and she will show us a bit of some bulbs that she's very excited to talk to you all about. And she'll be able to answer your questions live. So with that, let's see if we can get this video started, please let me know if the audio is too low. Hi, I'm Jackie Williams Courtright and we're here at Alden Lane Nursery and we are so happy to have the opportunity to talk about low and very low water need plants for our dry climate that's getting drier by the moment. And you know, there are so many wonderful, wonderful plants out there that really fit that description. Not only are hardworking California natives, but lots of Mediterranean plants from around the world, South Africa, Australia, of course, the Mediterranean, all fit into that category. Many of them do, which is very exciting. What I'd like to start with is to share with you some edibles for um, the landscape. You know, edibles don't have to be relegated to the orchard. They could be incorporated into your landscape. And behind me, I'm going to share with you some really great edible landscape options that are low need. They include jujube. This is Chinese date. 
and it is just really a very, very water-wise tree that uh, does extremely well in this area. It is leafless in the wintertime. It does have some thorns, so you have to be careful about that. Um, and there are a lot of different varieties of Chinese date, but this is a lovely one to include. This is loquat. And loquats, I remember growing up with loquats, and they're kind of an orange apricot-sized fruit, but it has a pretty big seed in it, but it has a very distinctive, sweet, delicious flesh. Um, evergreen, in this case, low water need, a beautiful ornamental part of the landscape, as well as meeting our need. All the way down here, we have pomegranate. Um, wonderful, easy to grow, not too many problems, not too many creatures or diseases cause problems for it. They produce incredibly beautiful flowers, the red flowers, and of course, the beautiful fruit that is not only gorgeous to look at, fabulous for decoration, but wonderful to eat and filled with antioxidants. And persimmon, very interesting. Persimmons, all persimmons, and it's just really one of my favorite landscape plants or plants to include in the garden because A, it's low water need. B, it has, produces the most delicious, wonderful fruit. There is the um, fuyu type, which is more like a tomato-shaped fruit that you can eat like an apple. And then there's the hachia, which is sort of more acorn-shaped that you allow to become almost custard before you eat it. If you eat it too soon, it's like astringent, it's like alum. Um, and then the leaves turn amazingly beautiful fall colors, which is fabulous. Um, and then after the leaves have fallen, many times the fruit is still hanging, and so you have this great decoration in the garden. Talk about fall, and then it gives you delicious fruit to eat as well. Um, included in the edibles, we have um, herbs over here, um, and this is bay, bay leaf, sweet bay, loris nobilis, low water need plant. I call this the, uh, the bay of commerce and the bay of antiquity because this is the bay leaf you're going to find in the shilling box on the spice aisle, and this is the bay leaf that were used by ancients at Olympics to create the crowns for the Olympians and super plant for the garden, evergreen, and ready spice uh, to harvest. Um, this is rosemary. This happens to be Tuscan blue. Um, there are many rosemaries. They're all good for cooking, perhaps some others better than, than not. Um, but this one, I can remember my mother harvesting a branch and washing it, drying it, and using it as a basting brush when she was barbecuing. Um, beautiful plant to include into the landscape and very, very um, water-wise. Um, caper, talk about Mediterranean. I met capers when we were in Malta. We had a Cal Poly classmate, a Maltese uh, classmate, and we visited him, and we saw capers growing from the rock walls on Malta. Um, now, this is kind of like an olive. You don't just harvest it and eat it. You, there's a process kind of like an olive that you need to, to go through, but capers on the very low water need list. Then we have, um, this is lemon verbena. It's leafless in the wintertime. If we can only communicate the wonderful aroma, wonderful for teas, low water need here. All the sages. Look at the diversity of color in the sages. These are culinary sages with the tricolor, the purple, and the broadleaf sage. And mints, very interesting. I was so surprised to find mint as a low water need plant because I all, you know, they love water, but they can survive certainly with less water. And, um, and that's probably not a bad thing because you want to contain them. We talk about putting them in a pot, not the ground, because they will come up in the living room. You've got to be careful. But if you keep it as a dry plant, it will kind of stay in one place. And then thyme is a great addition to your water-wise garden. Um, and there are many times this happens to be French, there's English, 
all kinds of great times. So that's just a sampling of the wonderful, very unthirsty edibles that you can include in your landscape. Okay. In addition to the wonderful edibles that we can integrate into our ornamental landscape, there are so many other categories of plants that we'll be talking about in just a moment. But what a great opportunity we have to turn lawn into landscape. Um, come up with all these amazingly wonderful other options for, um, that are a little less thirsty. So one of the categories is our ornamental grasses or grass type plants that, that's kind of interesting, we could replace with something a little less thirsty and that includes this group here. This is red fountain grass. Isn't that beautiful? Um, now this uh, is, it, is le it's leafless or it, um, it rests in the, uh, in the winter time and it comes back strong in the spring. It has these beautiful red leaves all summer and now we've got these incredibly beautiful plumes of red um, that provide um, beautiful interest. Um, and then I like to keep them going until after Thanksgiving because after that they, they sort of start to turn to like corn stalks and they look very fallish. And then after Thanksgiving, I'll cut it to the ground and then it will renew itself. Down here, this is Lamandra. This is not a grass at all, it's a sedge, but it's so interesting. Um, it is super low water need and uh, it comes in a lot of different forms, but it is just this fluffy grass. You don't buy it for the flowers, you buy it for this lovely fluffy look. And you know, the wind moves through it. Very, very pretty plant to add. And this little guy, um, this is a juncus. And you know, many times I think of it as being something that needs a lot of water. It doesn't. It is a very unthirsty plant. So this is juncus. And you can see it has a lot of architectural interest, which is really fun. This is blue fescue, festuca. Um, and that silvery foliage is really great. Now you can treat this kind of like a lawn. If it gets a little rough, you just cut it right back, just like a, a lawn and it just whooshes right back. And this one is uh, pink muley grass, pink muley grass. And it has, you know, very typical grassy leaves at the bottom. And then it has these incredibly beautiful plumes of flowers um, that, um, are so decorative in the fall. So that is a wonderful group of the grass-like plants that can be incorporated for some interest in your landscape. We haven't talked a lot about color, um, but we're gonna see a lot of that now. And uh, we have some amazingly beautiful, uh, very unthirsty additions to the garden. This is called status and um, it is just a really hardy, easy to grow plant. Um, and it has these big thick leaves that hold moisture and these gorgeous blossoms. Um, and that is Parisii uh, status, Limonium Parisii. This is uh, a beautiful type of Spanish lavender. All the lavenders fit into this category. Um, of being less thirsty. This happens to be an especially beautiful one with a very silvery foliage and kind of a pink, pink blossom. And this one I think was Gray Ghost, if, as I recall. Let me just look really quick. And this one is, oh, Ghostly Princess. All right. In the back, and boy, what a beautiful pairing with the silver and the blue. This is called Plumbago. Plumbago is a viney shrub that um, is great in sun, morning sun, um, very big, very billowy, can go up a fence if you allow it to. Uh, in years past, it's kind of gone dormant in the winter time. Mine for the last two or three years has remained evergreen. So clearly it is warming, uh, but plumbago is an excellent one to add to the garden. And the lavender is beautiful with the blue. Look at this, this is um, lavender, um, lantana, trailing lantana, and you're going to see more lantana as we go along um, with the different types of lantana, but a very, very good one, very low water need. Salvias, all the eyes. There are lots of salvias on the list, but one category of salvia are the gregii that give you a tremendous amount of color, and they come in everything. This is a beautiful bright red, 
but they come in everything from a very white, soft pink, kind of an, an orangey shade, um, just lovely combinations of color with whatever will work for you. And then all the way here up at the top, we have blue hibiscus, and this is called Aleogeny, A-L, Aleogeny, um, and it has that lovely purple flower. It is evergreen um, and does a, an extremely good job here. And then we have a little mallow as well that is on that wonderful list. So um, all the, uh, the water retailers, uh, many of them are offering these fabulous rebates um, for uh, lawn to landscape programs. And these are all on that list, which is really great. Um, so all the ones that will qualify for that rebate. All right, um, this is a type of Coreopsis and is on the list. Isn't that great? Um, very colorful, not evergreen. It goes down and then comes back up again. This is Nepeta or cat mint, um, very low water need with that kind of pretty gray foliage in the blue flower. Um, and then we have um, the Santa Barbara daisy, um, which it will give you lots of color in the garden. And this is something called Arisimum bowls mauve with the purple flower. Just a really interesting story about this plant. Some of you may remember the 1990 freeze. It was December 23rd, 1990 at about 5.30 in the afternoon. The temperature dipped below freezing and it stayed below feet freezing 24 hours a day for two weeks. Swimming pools, there was an inch of ice on them, pipes froze in houses. Um, this plant was in a demonstration garden that we had at the nursery. It bloomed right through that entire freezing episode. I was so struck by its hardiness, oh my goodness. And it doesn't have to be cold for it to be beautiful. It is just an amazing plant. So this is called Arisimum, E-R, Arisimum Bowls Mauve. I was so happy to see on this list geraniums, pelargoniums, and I shouldn't have been surprised because I can remember a lot of the plants that I'm talking about here were in my grandmother's garden where there was zero irrigation, zero irrigation. Uh, geraniums, so we have just the traditional garden geranium here, ivy geraniums, the ones that spill over the edge uh, of a container, and they are just so adaptable. Um, they can live in um, full sun, they can live, uh, ivy geraniums probably want a little shade break in the afternoon. Um, half a day of sun for all of the varieties would be very, very agreeable, that would work. Um, now this red apple, this is a really cool ground cover. It's really, you can see it's fleshy, succulenty. Aptenia, A-P-T, Aptenia um, is the name and it has these darling little, oh, oh look, oh look, little red flowers uh, that cover it. And I do remember this from my grandmother's garden. Um, underneath the date palm, which is also on the list, um, and this is just a fabulous ground cover um, and is remaining more and more evergreen. Uh, it is an evergreen ground cover, uh, but it is clearly um, staying that way longer into the winter time or the colder part of the year. Daimondia, you know, that's what I absolutely love about this uh, industry is there's always something new. Now, Daimondia for us have, has been a long, around for a long time, but years ago, we never knew what Daimondia was. And Daimondia is this very low, flat, mat-like ground cover um, that actually blooms beneath the leaves. It has a tiny little uh, yellow flower that is born beneath the foliage, but uh, it is just literally like a mat. And that's max height. I mean, we're talking maybe an inch and a half at the most. Um, very flat, very mat-like, and it does do a great job of competing with the weeds. Um, because of that. So this is called Daimondia, D-Y-M-O-N-D-I-A, Daimondia. Love, love, love this plant, especially for the kids in our lives. This is silver carpet, um, lamb's ears, water-wise, and has these wonderful fuzzy leaves, great to incorporate into the garden. Um, and uh, it just, there are a couple different varieties of it, but this one definitely is on the qualified list. 
which is really great fun. So this kind of feathery um, guy here is called Chalopsis. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower and um, is very low water need. I shouldn't say very low because it's, I think it's a low water need. It's a great addition to the low water landscape. Um, now we have these amazing California natives um, that include um, the manzanita. There are many, many manzanitas on this list. Uh, this happens to be one called Dr. Hurd that gets very large. Um, Arctostophilus is the um, botanical name, A-R, Arctostophilus. Um, so this is Manzanita here, Dr. Hurd. This is Howard McMinn. This is a, a smaller bush form, uh, maybe in the six foot range. Uh, this is Toyon, which um, is a small, small tree, beautiful white flowers and red berries. Um, wonderfully low water need. And then we have Ceanothus, many kinds of uh, C-E-A-N-O-S, uh, Ceanothus, T-H-U-S. And it is a group of wonderful evergreen California natives that have the most stunning blue flowers, mostly blue, sometimes white, uh, flowers in the spring. And there are ones that are tree form, like Ray Hartman, which would be a small tree, uh, to shrubs that would get to six, eight feet, to ground covers that are very low lying, and everything in between. So you have a big, big um, group of different Ceanothus or California wild lilac. Uh, this is white sage, uh, Salvia apiana white sage, beautiful silvery foliage. Um, and this is uh, another sage back here, very, very aromatic foliage. Um, and this one is the Clevelandi Pozo Blue. Um, and Pozo's down by San Luis Obispo, where I went to school. Um, great plant for a low water need garden. So lots of wonderful California natives. There is the California fuchsia, which I don't have to show you uh, today. It's, um, I think the, the new name is Epilobium, uh, E-P. Um, Zauchneri is the way I uh, studied it, but it's a great plant. Oh my goodness, beautiful red and orange flowers that are um, hummingbird magnet. Really, really fabulous. So that's a glimpse of some of our California natives, of which there are many, many, many more varieties. And you know, remember here, right here in Livermore is the Granada Native Garden, right on Marietta, across from that Rite Aid shopping center. Um, Jim Adam is one of the, the caretakers um, of that garden, and it's really worth walking through. It's a wonderful garden to take a look at. Then, okay, I know you're gonna wonder why I'm telling you, but gosh, it's the J word, junipers. Junipers are on the list. Junipers were very, very popular in the 60s. Um, and just like fashion, um, they are coming back. And there are some really amazingly beautiful junipers. This is one of my favorites, actually. This is called Japanese garden juniper, or Juniperus procumbens nana, a nice low profile um, growing juniper uh, that kind of has these beautiful arms that come out. Um, it's used a lot for bonsai, actually, that beautiful cascade. But junipers in general, um, and I think it's juniper species on the list, uh, can be used. And there are lots and lots of different varieties. There's the golden uh, junipers. There are, there's blue rug, which is a carpet-like one. This is carpet-like, too. So don't discount the junipers. All right. This is on Onothera, or uh, pink evening primrose. Um, it is a very hardy plant. It actually can be a little bit invasive if you're not careful, but I mean, who wouldn't like more of this? It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, Onothera, O-E-N. Onothera, pink Indian, uh, pink uh, evening primrose. This is very interesting. You would never guess that this is a holly. This is called Yaupon holly or Ilex. 
And the last part of the name, it's Ilex uh, vomitoria. But we'll just remember Yaupon holly. This is um, a, a plant that is tough as nails. You use it in the place of boxwood. And it, uh, we have it in the front of our garden uh, store in a little landscape, and boy, is it thriving. Small, tight, dense, you do not buy this for the flowers, but just a lovely green anchor plant in the garden. So it's, it's small, it's not big, not, not big at all. Um, all the way up here, we have a vine representing uh, vines uh, in that category. This is called uh, Carolina jessamine or gelsimium with a G, um, and that has, it's a, a perfectly evergreen vine, likes the sun, and it produces beautiful ye lemon yellow flowers in March, April, May, that time frame, which is a lovely time to have early in the spring to have color in the garden and very, very water wise. So this is Carolina jessamine, a great sun loving. It'll tolerate a little bit of shade. As long as it gets four to six hours of sun, you're good. I just love this little uh, cystus. Um, this is called Little Miss Sunshine. This is cystus, C-I-S-T-U-S, Little Miss Sunshine. It is a rock rose. And this rock rose has beautiful little small white flowers. But, you know, the white flowers are lovely. But I think what's really stunning is the foliage. Look at this beautiful mottled gold and green foliage. And this is a plant that's not going to get really huge. Um, it's going to only get about, um, you know, a foot to 18 inches wide and high. Um, and uh, just really is a perfect little plant that will enliven an area with that golden foliage. Uh, another great accent plant that is uh, part of the program is uh, this um, plant. This is called Dietes. It's a little iris. And it is uh, a beautiful white flower with kind of purple and purple markings on it. Um, and I just love the vertical accent that it gives the garden. And this is one that can be literally cut to the ground uh, if it gets a little um, worn um, and then it'll renew itself. Um, and it can be divided and you could share it with your friends like sourdough starter. You can just kind of shovel prune the edges and then along with the top of the plant and some of the roots, you can share it with your friends. This little fellow that is trailing over is called Parrot's Beak or Lotus, and it's a very unusual plant. Um, in the wintertime, typically this would go off color and not be super evergreen, but it has been looking better and better every year since it's been so warm. Uh, but you can see these very unusual little Parrot's Beak-like flowers. It's lovely. Uh, as a little spot ground cover. I like to use it in a pot spilling over the side. Um, but in your landscape, um, you can certainly use it as a little ground cover. This is Gallardia. Gallardia is a, with a G-A-I, Gallardia. Um, this is one that comes in all these lovely um, warm fall colors, oranges, yellows. Uh, it is what we call a deciduous perennial, which means that it goes dormant in the wintertime. It kind of goes away. Uh, if, if it looks a little rough in the fall, you just cut it to the ground, and then it just surprises you in the spring and pops back and is really a very durable plant, um, very hardy and very unthirsty. And then we have this little um, Australian fuchsia, and actually, let me just grab one here and bring it up. These two are cousins here, Australian fuchsia. They will produce these little bell-shaped flowers. And Korea, uh, C-O-R-R-E-A, Korea. Um, and the bell-shaped flowers are just, again, like hummingbird magnets. They just love them. And I found that they are a little happier in sort of morning sun, afternoon shade. Other people have had great success with them in even a, um, a hotter spot. Um, so that is Korea or um, Australian, Australian fuchsia. Myoporum um, parvifolium is a super fast, low water need ground cover that just, it just is like Olympic 
in terms of speed. It just will whoosh out and cover really big areas. You can literally plant this almost six to eight feet apart and you will have a carpet in, in a year. It just is phenomenal. A little more, more color and then we'll talk about some more green things. This is another lantana. Earlier in the program, um, we talked about uh, the lavender lantana, the more trailing type. Um, this one is um, the, uh, the one that has the more colorful flowers. This guy um, with the oranges and reds, and then they ha we have them in hot pink, um, the hot pink and rose and yellow, lots of really fun ones. This one can kind of go to bare stalks in the winter, depending on how cold it is, but they typically renew themselves in spring. Verbena. Verbena is on the list and all kinds of them, uh, and they come in a really wide um, variety of colors. Uh, white, white, uh, this beautiful red, dark purple, blue, pinks, uh, even bicolors, ones where the, uh, the flowers are two-toned with the white and uh, a lovely color. Uh, but this is a, another one that will give you tremendous summer bloom it sort of rests, you know, it's evergreen, but it sort of rests and looks wintry in the, the winter time. Uh, but it's meant to be evergreen. Back, back here, I just love this little fellow. This is called Cousin It Acacia. It is this fluffy, fun, wonderful accent in the garden. Uh, you, again, you do not buy it for the flowers. It blooms, but they're inconspicuous. Um, you buy it for this amazingly fun foliage that just enlivens an area. It's just really cute. So Cousin It Acacia, very, very cool plant. We're loving it. Um, gosh, again, eucalyptus uh, was very popular years ago, and now it's coming back again. This is silver dollar eucalyptus um, that actually will turn into a very, very large plant. Um, so, I mean, if you harvest a lot of the branches for your beautiful floral design displays in the house, that's great. Or prune it heavily or manage it in a container, you can keep it, you know, smaller. Otherwise, it could grow to 25 or 30 feet high. Uh, but this is a beautiful, ex extremely water -wise plant from Australia. Speaking of Australia, we've got woolly bush back here. Isn't he cute? He's on your list as well. Uh, Adenanthos. Adena, Adenanthos. Um, so woolly bush. Really um, a great one. Again, no flowers to speak of, but really interesting form. Behind that, we have leucodendron. Leucodendrons um, have these amazing um, red, what appear to be flowers at the tips of them, and they come in yellows and reds and oranges, all kinds of pretty colors. In actuality, these are just modified leaves, and the flower is a tiny little inflorescence in the center, but it gives you that appearance of flowers at the ends. Really an amazing, amazing plant. And um, so leucodendrons are going to, they can get six, eight feet high if you let them, but you can manage them as well. There is a really, really, really big group of grevilleas, a uh, large group of grevilleas. Uh, this happens to be one of my favorites. It's called grevillea. Uh, Mount Tam is sort of the, the nickname, uh, Mount Tamborita, and uh, it is uh, only a foot high, six feet wide. It looks like a little starfish to me, and I just love it because it's not only really cool looking, the plant is, not, is really cool looking, but it has these darling little very interesting flowers that um, hummingbirds love, and it blooms uh, more wintry, more fall wintry. Uh, into spring, but not so much in the dead of summer, um, which is, makes it very interesting to have in the garden. So this is a type of grevillea. We have a large grevillea in the back, this guy right here. I think this is Robin Gordon, um, and it has very long, uh, interesting flowers that are red um, that give you another dimension. Um, 
talk about interesting. This is called lion's tail. And lion's tail is an evergreen perennial. Uh, so it stays evergreen and it blooms sort of mid to late summer. And it has these, these are just opening up. So you can see what we call whorls of flower clusters, these little round balls along the stem. And you can see this orange. I mean, could it be more beautiful? Um, lion's tail, Leonotus is the name on the list. Leonotus, what a perfect name for lion's tail. Fabulous, fabulous. This is Dusty Miller, uh, and Dusty Miller is just a really easy to grow plant. Um, its fancy name is Senecio with an S, S-E-N. Um, and again, it does have yellow flowers, uh, which are quite nice, but I just love the silver foliage. And um, it just kind of is a great sort of accent. Um, that works really, really well in the garden. So that is Dusty Miller or Senecio. Um, this is a dwarf form of bottle brush or Callistamin, C-A-L, Callistamin. Um, and it is uh, the variety called Little John. It gets about three by three, four by four if it's exceptionally happy, which it tends to be here in this valley. Very prunable and easy to prune has these incredibly beautiful red brushes in spring and fall. And it is a fabulous um, you know, addition to our plant palette that we can use. So this is uh, a type of bottle brush called Little John. Olives, my goodness, you can't get more drought tolerant than olives. A great Mediterranean plant um, that does extremely well here. Um, and I mean, certainly we can grow ones that you can harvest a crop from and process, but remember it is a process. You cannot eat them off the plant. Um, or you can choose one that is uh, fruitless, which is not a bad thing. There's little Ollie, there's one called Swan Hill, there's another one called Wilson Eye. There are a number of varieties of olives that are, are meant to be fruitless. That said, except for the Swan Hill, uh, the other fruitless olives, if the sun and the moon and the stars all line up, you might get a few pieces of fruit. Not to be concerned, but that could happen. Um, but it's not a usual occurrence. So um, beautiful addition to our, our less thirsty garden, which is really terrific. Then we go down into kind of the succulent area. And one garden I really, really want you to go visit is the Ruth Bancroft Garden. Um, and I want to say it's in Walnut Creek. It has the most incredible, incredible collection of these wonderful low water need succulents. Um, but here we have just the plain, this is the one I grew up with. This is the hens and chickens, a little echeveria here that um, just will thrive, just thrives. That was in my grandmother's garden. This is a type of ice plant called Delospermum, D-E-L, Delospermum. Comes in white and other colors. This succulent is called um, Calendrinia, and I just love this plant. Um, it is just looks very little here, but this will turn into like a three to three and a half foot plant with the foliage at the bottom, and it spikes up with these incredibly beautiful hot pink flowers just really dramatic in the garden. I love, love, love it. And uh, then the agave, the aloes. You'll see a lot of aloes at the Ruth Bancroft. Um, and they just are great winter bloomers. And we have some in our, um, in our demonstration garden as well. Um, this is com something called Arctotus, A-R-C, Arctotus. Pink sugar is the variety, isn't that pretty? There's also one called pumpkin pie that's orange, orange. And then we have osteospermum. These are African daisies. Look at the variability in the color and the combination of color. Isn't it phenomenal? You know, I think I'm seeing this little guy for the first time this year. Very interesting. That's what I love, love, love about this industry. There's always something wonderful and new. Um, behind that, bulbine. This is bulbine, this one with the yellow flowers. Super low water need um, and just a real hit in our wonderful low water need gardens. And behind the aloe is our blue chalk Senecio, which is a distant cousin to Dusty Miller. So it is a succulent. You can see it's really pretty 
plump little gray foliage. So this is um, blue chalk Senecio. That's great. Oh, one more for South Africa, and that is um, the Uriops. This has a bright yellow daisy on it, reliably evergreen, um, and blooms a lot. And to complete the tropical um, theme, palms are on your list. And this is a really wonderful small palm uh, called Pygmy Date Palm, or Phoenix, P-H-O-E-N-I-X, Phoenix Robolini. Oh my goodness, that's Harry Potter-esque. Phoenix Robolini, robes and phoenixes. So Phoenix Robolini, um, and this one is great um, for um, an accent in the garden or in a container, but it's on the list and it's great. So that kind of completes our beautiful tropical, tropical mix. So this is a collection of some really amazingly wonderful Mediterranean plants, things that are um, low water need, that fit into our wonderful plant palette. And I was so, so happy. I was so happy to see cyclamen on the list. Now this is actually a bulb that um, likes to live in the shade, bright, bright shade, filtered sun. It is winter blooming. So that is probably its saving grace. So it kind of rests in the heat of summer and then it comes up, up back strong in the, the fall and winter and blooms all winter long. So this is just a fabulous plant to add for winter color in a garden that's not super, not super hot. It's got to be shady. This is a licorice plant or helichrysum. And this too is not a really hot area plant. This is a plant that would love to live in partial shade, filtered shade. Um, and I love it because it's, I think this one is called limelight. It has that golden, golden cast to it. And then another plant that likes to live in kind of partial shade is this one. This is called African boxwood. It's just a really nice upright evergreen shrub with kind of pinky stems. Again, no, and, and on the helichrysum and on the, um, the um, African boxwood myrcene, M-Y-R, myrcene, Africana. Um, this is one that doesn't have flowers, but it has this very interesting shape and these tiny little, lovely little leaves. Another one that would love morning sun, afternoon shade would be this one. This is called Loro Petalum, L-O-R-O Petalum. And it is commonly called fringe flower because it has this very unique fringy flower, which I don't think we have one on the plant. But it has this darling and they're typically raspberry in color. They can be raspberry, they can be a, a darker shade. Rarely, sometimes you can find white. Um, but Laura Petalum, it has this lovely sort of arching, fountainy kind of growth form. And I think they're happiest in morning sun, afternoon shade. So the Alstroemeria, I was just over the moon when I saw it on the list. This is Alstroemeria. Alstroemeria is the longest lasting cut flower in a vase. So if you have a little spot in your garden where you can tuck this, this is great. You know, it kind of goes up and down, so it's not a solid state evergreen. But when it blooms, boy, it gives you lots of color. And if you want to enjoy it just in the garden, you can do that. But you can certainly enjoy it in the house. And stems have been known to last for cut for up to two weeks. All Stromeria Peruvian lily is the, uh, is the common name. And this one will work in a sunny spot, but I, again, have seen it a little happier in partial uh, with a little shade break in that hottest part of the afternoon. This gray one is called um, uh, Bush Morning Glory, Convolvulus, C-O-N, Convolvulus. Um, and it is, gets two, two to four feet high, uh, high and wide. It has Morning Glory, round, white little flowers with this, against the silvery foliage, which is very, very nice. Hot sun loving on this one, hot sun loving. Um, Boy, this has been around forever, for an ever and ever. This is called Pink India Hawthorn. And uh, Hawthorns, these are the Raphia lepis. And uh, botanically, it's uh, spelled R H A P H, Raphia lepis, or Pink India Hawthorn. And they typically, it, it blooms just for us because they're not meant to be blooming in fall. Uh, they're meant to be blooming in spring. But at least we have a glimpse of what they're meant to look like. 
all the Nandinas. Nandinas have been around forever. Heavenly bamboo is another common name for them. It's not a bamboo at all. Uh, but this one is a new, one of the sunset uh, series plants that are super water wise. And this is uh, lemon lime with this lovely, lovely uh, chartreuse new growth. Um, but there are many varieties of Nandina that are um, ones that will work um, in, this, in this list. Over here, this is Westringia. This is an Australian. Um, it's a coast rosemary, but it's not a rosemary at all, but it has this really, really nice, um, you know, lavender blossom. And um, is just a, a lovely, you know, this particular variety is gonna get probably four by five. You know, it's a, a good size plant. Uh, this is the little ollie olive. We saw it in little tree form a moment ago, but this is the shrub or bush form. And this is a little fruitless miniature olive that's great, um, great just as a single plant. Just a great, great plant. Uh, the variegated one back here is, this is called, mer it's variegated myrtle or um, myrtus communis, M-Y-R-T, myrtus communis compacta variegata is the long name. Um, it has, if you pinch the, the foliage, it has a wonderful aromatic fragrance. It has little white flowers. Um, just a really tough, durable plant that really performs well. In hot sun loving areas, it'll even, it'll be a little bit more relaxed looking if you give it a little shade break in the afternoon. This is mint, um, mint bush, a really great shrubby plant that um, is, you know, kind of upright oval in form, but has this really cute little variegated leaves. And uh, it's six feet high, four feet wide, and it has really darling little uh, violet flowers on it, which makes it really cute. Um, this is, here's another Australian here. This is Australian bluebell. And if you look very closely, you'll see little tiny bell-shaped flowers. Um, it's a viney shrub that likes to live in uh, kind of dappled shade, not the hottest spot, not the hottest spot. This is just a small sampling of all the wonderful low and very low water plants that you have to choose from um, should you wish to go from lawn to landscape. These are the ones that qualify um, for your rebate, which is really wonderful. Now let me share with you that uh, water-wise plants um, don't reach their full water wiseness until they're about two years old or twice their size. Uh, so that's why it's really perfect to be thinking about planting in fall because the soil is summer warmed, the air temperatures are going to start to come down a bit. It's really great insurance to get these plants off to a really good beginning. So very, very important. I just, we had a wonderful time sharing with you some of these really interesting and fun plants. And I know that you can transform your garden into a, a wonderful, um, low water need, beautiful oasis. So, um, you know, we're all here to help and look forward to, uh, to lending a hand. That was fantastic, Jackie. Oh my golly. It was fun. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. Okay. Your passion for plants really, really shines through. It really does. That's what I kept saying. I even texted Natalie and I said, boy, oh boy, she loves oh. plants. So <laughs> would you, um, does anybody on the panel have anything they'd like to share before we go into our Q&A by chance? Um, yes, we did have a comment from one of our environmental staff. She was just mentioning that if you do live in an area um, near like an open space preserve or some kind of natural area, just be aware. Um, try to make good choices about if you're putting in invasive plants mm. that could um, spread really easily. Just try to be aware of, you know, where you're placing it or its ability to spread. Um, maybe think about putting it in a pot or some kind of something to contain it so it doesn't spread into open space. So obviously, if you're in... Um, if you're in more of a neighborhood situation, it's maybe not as much of a big deal, but just try to be kind of aware of your surroundings and um, what you're putting in and how it could affect kind of the greater environment. That's excellent advice. Pass our thank yous on for sure. 
And Jackie, did you have any um, thoughts as we as we uh, transition into our uh, important questions? Sometimes I, I I try to help answer simple questions, but all of these are for you, my friend. So uh, I I can start in if you would like. Sure, sure. Let's start. Yeah, that's great. Okay, let's start. So, um, so the first question is: Are all of the plants on the plant list available at Alden Lane? So, uh, so on the list that we presented today, mm -hmm. are they're, they're here. Not all the plants on the Wuckels list, which right. is the Wuckels list is this, this, I mean, it's right. pages and pages. Yeah. We distilled that list down with the help of a great staffer, Nancy, um, and we came up with plants that we've had or have and from that list we shared the plants that we shared in the video um and so not all of them are available um mm -hmm. but many of them are excellent answer because it's i i when i saw the word all i was concerned about that so yes perfect answer thank you so much um and then jean is asking will all the plants work for all of zone 9a for example stockton you know, I think they, I think they will. I think they will. You know, there are a couple that are a little bit frost tender, and Stockton I think is a little chillier than we are here because we clearly are warming. Not that they, you know, not that Stockton's not too, but um, you know, with a little bit of protection for some of those frost tenders, they'd be fine. Excellent. Thank you so much. One of the other, Yvonne and Kevin asked about, uh, will you be talking about soil types? And um, and I know that we didn't talk about soil types today, but we are fortunate that we have another uh, webinar that we conducted a, a few, well, how many days ago was it, Natalie? It was recently um, that is available uh, for viewing. What's, what's up with that one, Natalie? Is it on you too? Yes. Um, so we had two previous webinars that went a little bit into soils. One of them was called Irrigation 101, and one was called How to Grow Edibles Water-Wise. Mm -hmm. Both of those are available on YouTube, so I can send out a link to both of those webinars um, along with the link to this recording. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, people will be thrilled at that. Go ahead. Sorry, Jackie. Yeah, no, I just wanted to share that there are multiple soil types in our valley. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously the vineyard soil, which is rocky, well-drained soil. Um, there are um, in the north, um, sort of north of Livermore and east, very, very heavy clay soil. If uh, history, history has it that uh, uh, we we did bricks here from the clay, you know, in the soil. So very, very heavy soil, non-draining soil. Uh, in the middle of Livermore, it's very loamy, but I think that has a lot to do with the arroyo and the alluvial soil that came from all of that. Yeah. Um, so you just have, it's very, very important to know your soil. And I think one really important key is that the soil must drain. It has to drain unless you're doing a bog plant and it's, that's not on the list. I think maybe a mint, huh? Um, so my suggestion is that people dig a hole a foot deep, a foot wide, fill it with water and it must be gone in 12 to 24 hours. Oh. As long as you get that kind of drainage, you're good. In the super, super clay heavy area, especially north of uh, the freeway, um, it's clay, so very salty, sodic soil and gypsum is just a very economic addition to the soil that will help relax the clay and allow you to leach the salt from the, the soil. So soil is a very big part of it, and yes. uh, but drainage is absolutely critical. Okay, good to know. I'm sure somebody, if they came into your uh, location, could get more uh, information on that as well. That's awesome. Um, so how about any evergreen low or very low any evergreen low or very low water, sun loving wine or hedge plant suggestion. So any, an evergreen low or very low water, sun loving wine or hedge plant suggestion. Maybe vine? <laughs> vine, vine, I'm sorry, a hedge or a vine? What it was says that? sun loving, oh, it says wine. Okay, so vine, yeah, that's probably a typo. Okay, and not to worry. I've. I bet it is wine. Vine. So, so I can't decide. 
So low growing vine. So that might um, fit into the ground cover, um, you know, part, huh? Um, okay. So we would have to kind of cross reference and look. I mean, what okay. we should need to use is your wickles. That cute. Yeah, have it handy up. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'd be yeah. here till seven though if we did that. Yeah, we did. We, we okay. would do that. So my suggestion is that I need to look at the list and then um, give me a call at the nursery or email there you me. Go. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Well, our our customers do have to do a little bit of homework. So we feel like this is such a great information sharing opportunity to to allow it's a jump start if you will to hear your passion for plants and then i i hope that this really uh encourages folks to really start a project yeah, yeah. okay so let's see um this one uh alina says hi jackie if we buy low water use plants from alden lane in one gallon or five gallon pots and plant them after sheet mulching and getting rid of the front lawn, how often should we water them until they get established and for how long each time? Hmm. Yeah, it's that's, that's very hard. It has a lot to do with how quickly your soil drains, number right. one, okay. and it has everything to do with the weather. So um, when we talk to people, we say, we don't water by the calendar, water by the weather. Um, and one really helpful tip is that when you take a plant home from the nursery, please, please pre-water it. I like to take a bucket um, from the home store, fill it two thirds of the way filled with water, submerge the pot in into the, uh, the bucket, let all the bubbles bubble so that you know the whole root ball is nice and hydrated. Yeah. Because when they leave uh, the nurseries, the water in each one of those pots is different. And if you handle them all the same, when they go home, you're gonna have some failures. So um, I think it is, I love to tell people with a new planting, um, check them if it's a really tiny plant, uh, I check them twice a day. Go out with your cup of coffee in the morning, your beverage of choice at night and, and check in on your plants and start to get to know them, the signs of, the, of need. Um, so initially so you're gonna deep water the plant in the pot, you're going to um, plant, plant the plant, making sure that your soil drains. Another very important tip that is often forgotten is that you wanna make sure you never bury the top of the soil that's in the pot. Cover, you don't wanna cover the root ball. And with sheet mulching, you know, well, your sheet mulching, you're, go through, you're going through the sheet mulching, but you don't want any mulch right up around the crown of the plant. You wanna back it away about okay. six inches because that will cause lots of problems. Um, so I like to, you've pre-watered the plant, you're watering them in, you've got your irrigation in place. And um, then it may be, you know, I hate schedules because it's all about all of these other factors, but it may be, um, you know, twice a week at first. Um, Nancy on our staff has a low water need garden that she, you know, this is more established now, is once a week or once every two weeks, depending with a, a deep mulch. Uh, but at first, you need to keep an eye on those plants um, and go as far as feel the soil, look at the plant. Almost every plant will tell you when it needs water. Uh, it will relax a little bit or it turns off color. But these are nuances you need to s spend time and get to know your plant. So it's hard for me to tell you how often. No, yeah, that makes sense, too. And also, I just want to add in um, that it's important also to when we're talking about watering, please check with your municipality if there are any water restrictions that are occurring within your um, geographic area. That's just important. But so there's a, a lot of hands on with this, especially when you're when you're getting new plants. They're like new babies, right? They need to. Well, not like, but, you know, they're your new plants, right? You have to take care of them. Absolutely. So, um, OK. I didn't mean the reference to babies. I have three of them my own. Well, they're not babies anymore, but anyway. So um, Sue was looking to find out if Alden Lane would have a list of water conserving plants for their customers to pick up before shopping at the site. So I think they're looking at prearranging a selection with you. Do you offer that service? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, well, in addition to the list that you, um, Natalie, does everybody have this list that you sent out, this wonderful list that has to do with the plants that we just talked about, right? Uh, so you have that list. And um, we were so excited to be able to take the, the Wuckles list and kind of bring it down into things that we could we could find or get. 
And so our next goal, and unfortunately it's not ready for today, but within the next week or so, we will have kind of the top 50 shrubs, the top 10 trees, the, you know, the 10, you know, the 20 wonderful blooming perennials, evergreen, all ground covers and all of that. So yes, we will have those and we're here to be your guide. Awesome. Uh, Natalie, just a quick time check. How are we doing? Because I'm, we're getting more and more questions. So I just want to be cognizant of that. So we have about 15 minutes until this uh, webinar was about to wrap up. Gotcha. Okay, great. So um, quick question. Oh, um, yes, of course. Natalie, it looks like a couple people um, are saying they didn't get the list. Will you be sending that out later? Or do you have a link to it um, that you can send out to people now in the chat? Yeah, I'll try to drop it in the chat now. Um, I sent it out beforehand, but if you registered today, you might have not received that email from me. Um, but I will include it again in the follow-up email that has a link to this recording. So Sounds give me a second. Great. I'll put it in the chat. You great. got it. No worries. And now I, I know we have a little bit more time, so that's great. Um, so we're looking for any information about if you can suggest... Oh, that's a, you good? I'm sorry. Again, what was the question? No, no I hadn't finished yet. Sorry. Um, can you suggest anything for under redwoods? Uh, oh, so that's a tough one. I'll bet. Yes. Yeah, it's a real tough one. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, um, the roots are so voracious. Um, you know, you almost have to take a sawzall to cut out a place to even plant, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're so competitive. Um, so there are a few ferns. I have heard, not that for Garia, you know, I've heard that um, ground cover uh, strawberry works pretty well um, under redwoods. Um, and acid loving things, but the biggest problem, the biggest problem is the density of the shade uh, that's offered and the, um, the competition of the roots that take every bit of nutrient. You have to almost double feed your plants to be able to give them food and, you know, that the tree is not taken by the, by the tree. tree. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. I think we may have a list someplace at the nursery, but I don't have it at the tip of my Okay. I think everyone knows where to find you so that you can expect that and that okay. leads us to the next question. Um, will you have that assortment of plants on display um, at Alden Lane for for the consumers to see in person? You yes, you know, um, uh, Cindy was just reminding me that we we do have displays of these mm -hmm. plants and we will make sure that we have one of the wickles or the, you know, the qualifying plants. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we have these little blue signs in the back of the description signs that say water wise. And we'll go as far as to indicate if they're low or very low. And so it makes it really easy for people to kind of self shop. But, you know, obviously we're here to help. For sure. That That's sounds great. great. Um, and then, uh, what about ground coverings? So someone is looking to replace their lawn, Corey is looking to replace their lawn and then that they're a ground covering that their dog could lay on because she loves the coolness of the lawn. So there's one plant, um, it's available in sod only. It's, uh, Carapia. Um, it is, um, Lipia is the old name. And it is a lawn substitute that takes 60% less water than grass. Now, I haven't even looked on this list to see if it's here. I was, right. assume it is. We'd have um, to double check. I, I know the Cal Water Program doesn't allow for any lawn-like plant. Well, so, it's not grassy. Yeah. Right, right. So we'd, double, we'd have to double check on that, um, whether or not it is eligible for um, a plant in the rebate program. Yeah, yeah. But it, I have heard um, of Karapi. I've seen it too. It is nice. Yeah, no, it is. It has a little clover-like uh, flower. Um, I saw it years ago. It's probably still in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, that is one that would work. And there are a lot of uh, ground cover plants. Daimondia is a great one, but it's not a plant that's going to take traffic all the time. I love to put it between uh, big pieces of flagstone mm -hmm. with plenty of space between the stones so mm -hmm. that the stones will heat up and, and transfer the heat to the plants. And that's mm -hmm. not good. But, you know, in mm -hmm. that setting, that would work great. Um, all those super low growing right. uh, ground covers like Daimondia. That looks really pretty. I've seen it in the landscape before too. Okay, so we, you might remember, let's see here. 
what is the name of the light green ground cover that you said uh, is fast growing and can spread up to six feet with little white flowers? Do you remember yeah, that? It's, yeah, it's Myoprum, um, M-Y-O-P, Myoprum parvifolium. It is amazing, amazing. And our little tiny six packs, the little label says, put it every six feet apart. And I, every 72 inch, every 72 inches. I'm going, my, a tiny little plant. Mm. It just is unbelievably fast. Really good. It's a great plant. Great. Okay. Not so, trap, you know, you don't traffic it, but I mean, right. it's very low. It's great. Okay. And then uh, James is saying that it was an interesting presentation. However, he has trees in his lawn. And how does he convert his lawn with its watering needs to low water needs and keep the trees? So that's a tough one, but you're the expert. So no, it's all about irrigation. Uh, you're going to you're going to do drip irrigation, right? For the other uh, areas that you're converting and you're just going to put more drippers around that tree. And uh, I can tell you that uh, East Bay Mud has this great brochure on exactly how to do that. Hmm. You can go online and they have the brochures that you can see. We have them printed out here at the nursery as well, but it's really beneficial. Um, and so what you do, and, and there's a product called Netifem, which is a mm -hmm. um, kind of a, a drip line that is drip interfaces with, and you can put that around. It's kind of like a, a, a very high tech soaker hose, um, but it's not just one line. It's, you know, multiple lines or multiple um, emitters around your trees opposed to your plants in your your landscape will require maybe one or two emitters at the most a tree is going to require many and the emitters need to you know emitters have different volumes uh, per uh, per uh, hour so you'll want big well pardon me water guys bigger volume emitters around the trees okay it can be done okay uh, let's see. Thank you for that. Is Gan, Gaz, Gazinia, sorry, Gazania, no. I, a, a type of was. diamanda, and I don't think, okay, Gazania is on the list. Is it a no, low water plant? Sorry. I, I truly believed it was because mm -hmm. it, it is a native to South Africa. It was growing in um, an abandoned lot out um, in Springtown, and I just knew for sure it was a low water need plant, but it's modern. It's moderate. Okay. Okay. And then Jean was uh, asking, do you recommend underground drip irrig irrigation versus above ground drip lines? I think that depends. Yeah, right? you know, that's a tough one. I mean, mm -hmm. below ground, that would be like the Netifem, I think. And that's probably part of your irrigation program that you did or will do. Um, and, you know, it's, Either one, something can go wrong with, I guess. Um, and you just have to be very, very mindful of kind of watching your plants and making sure they're doing what they're doing. The above ground ones, you know, earwigs can clog a head. Um, squirrels can chew them to drink water. You know, there are a lot of different kind of hazards with, with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I guess below ground, it's a little less problematic. Um, it's just that it's just further away from you're getting to yeah right yeah i can see it yeah it depends it just depends uh, i guess on the situation and the landscape if it's brand new it's if it's a brand new irrigation system are you are you retrofitting it seems like there's a lot of factors or that could go into that um so pat's looking for ideas for colorful fall winter annuals that can survive our hot winter sun not thirsty plants no, nope. there's yeah, there's okay. not. Well, you I mean, know, you you showed a whole lot of beautiful plants. Yeah, and you so. know they are going to give you color. Like the verbena are in full mm -hmm. bloom now. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be absolutely lovely. So you know we would walk. You know, and we didn't get a chance. Uh, these are fall planted for spring spring blooming, and so we'll talk about you know the bulbs really quick that are on the list, and that's uh, freesias. It smells wonderfully. Uh, this is Ixia African Cornflower, which is another great one. Um, Harlequin Flower or Sporaxis is a great one. So these, but these are more spring or summer bloomers. Um, this is uh, Muscari um, Grape Hyacinth, which is, is on the list. Um, 
So, yeah, I don't think on the list or anything that qualifies, I can tell you that, um, you know, there are products like uh, um, polymers that can cut your watering in half um, that you can use in the soil to grow things that are, not, you know, that they're not going to qualify for your list, but for people that want to just have a lovely pot of, of flowers that are a little less thirsty. And I would just invite um, everybody to come out and just walk the aisles with us or, or any nursery and just see what's blooming now. There are a lot okay. of things that are blooming. Or I always recommend that folks, you know, walk their neighborhood and if they mm. like um, what they see, you know, potentially take pictures without, you know, the neighbors wondering why or what have you. But um, and then they could potentially bring that to you and say, hey, Jackie, oh, I saw this beautiful plant. It's doing wonderfully, you know, so then you could that could open up a dialogue for Absolutely. for you. Uh, so Susan Hayes is saying, uh, Susan is saying I that she uses Mondo grass under mine and it's doing well. And I I would guess that that might be uh, the, the question underneath the redwood tree. She yeah, uses yeah. Mondo grass under hers. So I like it. Yeah, does that I like sound it. like it's a match? It is. I, I don't know okay. that it's on your list, but it, it absolutely, that's a great one. Great okay. one. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know. I've learned, I've learned so much. And um, panelists, are there any other questions that you think I might have missed? I didn't really go into the chat section. So maybe I should go there. Folks are asking for some recommendations with each other. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. Okay. it. okay, great. Thank you so much. So Jackie, wow. We made it through. This is so great. I, uh, I'm so thrilled uh, that you shared your passion and information with all of our customers. And uh, Natalie, do you want to bring us home? Sure. Um, just wanted to remind everybody, um, you know, if you're interested in applying for one of the lawn conversion rebates that we have in the Tri-Valley, now is the perfect time. Like Jackie said, fall is when you want to put these plants in the ground um, and convert over to something that's a little less thirsty. Um, so if you have any questions about the rebate um, requirements. I'm going to have um, emails for each of your water service providers included in the follow-up email that I'm going to send to everybody. You'll also get the recording. You'll get a list of all of the plants that Jackie talked about today and a link to our previous webinars. So you'll be all set on your WaterWise journey. All right. And that's all I got for you guys today. Did anyone else want to say something before we uh, sign off? It was great. Jackie, that was great. <laughs> oh, great fun. Thank you. I couldn't have done it without you guys. Uh, it's great. Thank you. We're thrilled to have had you. So thanks again. And we're signing off. Oh, I like someone said plants are our babies. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take good care, everyone. Have a great night. We appreciate your time. Good night, everyone.